Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks to you both. Um, two um, very um, different papers, um, both in very different registers. This is partly what I wanted to um, ask about. Um, as I understand, as I, I mean, what I, the way I frame it, might you might want to push back against. But um, Leela, I think you're writing and presenting to us in something that's pretty close to a literary register. That is, that's my my reading of what you're doing. As a result, I don't have a, a question for you. Um, Roland, you're also in a way, but, but it doesn't mean I'm finished with you, <laughs> Leela, exactly. Um, R Roland, um, you're also in a way dealing with two, two different registers, one of um, uh, literary and theoretical critique, which is the, the discourse of Gilroy, Hartman, et al., and the other is, um, is um, McKnight's uh, literary register. And my question for, for you, Roland, is in a sense where your primary concern is with these, with these two um, registers, because um, you're, you get, gave us this extremely eloquent in a sense, background of a, of a kind of problematic, and it's the problematic that McKnight is dealing with, which is to say, you know, the complicity of black intellectuals in in capitalism. I mean, br briefly, briefly, sort of um, stated. Um, and then, you, you know, you you gave us the, also this, uh, you know, a very eloquent and and interesting uh, analysis of the ways in which um, McKnight um, is making that um, concern the object of a, a, essentially a literary, i.e. a satirical kind of treatment. It, it's not clear that he is critiquing in, in exactly the way that I hear you sort of wanting to do. I mean, he, in, other words, in other words, his work is, is presenting it, describing, presenting it to us, parodying, satirizing. So I think my question is, where is the main sort of like emphasis of your um, 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 project. I mean, are you are you sort of um, is your main emphasis McKnight and the, and the sort of the body of contemporary lit literary work, work that is concerned with the same problematic, or is your concern really the the problem of um, let's say anti-capitalist rhetoric that is not borne out by the real economic relations that the intellectuals that you're interested in are um, are clearly sort of in some sense. Um, Complicit in, um, so that, that's sort of like the more or less the, the sort of question I, I have. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, is that is that working? Yep. Okay. Um, I, I guess I would have to say that um, it's uh, it's definitely both simultaneously. Um, if it wasn't coming across in the paper, uh, that's my fault, I suppose. But I think. You know, the, the, the two strains of the argument sort of are mutually constitutive in my mind, right? Because uh, I don't think you can sort of fully appreciate the, the pointedness of what's taking place in McKnight's narrative and the kind of institutional and economic concerns in it without it being in dynamic relations to, to a kind of to, to a widely sort of institutionalized body of knowledge about diaspora and um, the place of black Americans in that diaspora community. So what I was hoping to do was sort of like create a kind of dynamic interplay between those two things. Um, and, and, and in doing so to have each speak to the other, each inform the other, right? Um, not just to sort of have a not just for the, to provide a kind of context for a reading, but also to say that the, that the, the literature, because it, because it too is such a kind of institutional creature, right, is, um, is speaking the language of those theorists and speaking back to them in rather kind of robust ways, right, and, they, and the, together in tandem these form a kind of, um, a kind of period in internationalist thought that has to be thought about together to, to make sense of it. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron, and then um, Amanda. My question is 
very similar um, to Tim's. Um, for you, Ron, thank you so much for your talk. I um, really learned a lot. And I, I, I guess I wanted to spend, uh, or I would like to invite you to spend more time thinking about how precisely, not, not just the literary more generally, but satire specifically, mm -hmm. is doing the work where other discourses and other registers seem to fail. In other words, you very successfully point out there's no exit, there's only complicity, and then here's something that's made possible um, through satire. And then I guess, um, Leela, I loved your intervention, and I'm curious how um, you might imagine, and you can just tell me, no, um, an apparatic, an apparatic relation between uh, relationship and separation. You want to go ahead, Leela? Go ahead. Can she hear? Can, can you hear us? Yes, I can. I can. I'm, I, I'm just yes, go ahead. I, I'm, I, that's what I was, um, I'm saying. Um, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, is there an apparatic uh, relationship between relationship and separation? Um, Rather than a separation or an oppositional hmm. relation? Well, yes, yes, uh, yes, <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> uh, very, very, very much so. Uh, 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 <laughs> uh, I, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, uh, I would have liked there to be uh, aporia, um, but it, there isn't, I mean, but, but they are mutually constituted. Uh, you know, they are mutually constituted, that uh, the, um, the, 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 the non-violent work of a relationship conceived within the messy, para promiscuous paradigms that I have put together um, only uh, becomes, uh, comes into its own as uh, something that inhibits separation, something that inhibits separation. And there too also, uh, uh, you know, separation manifests violence in a certain way. So they are constituted uh, if um, uh, and uh, uh, opposition, um, but but certainly at at odds. Therefore, not apparatic in the way that uh, perhaps Lila was making this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Think of it. Yeah, I mean. In this particular, you, yeah, your questions about satire and sort of like uh, what what I think sort of the the genre of satire is adding to this discourse. Yeah, I mean, I think s satire is sort of like a, a an, an an ideal sort of literary form for this kind of engagement, right? Uh, in that it has that sort of always has that sort of double voiced character right of at being being able to sort of mimic and parody uh, a particular discourse and its logic and sort of show it to you uh, at the same time that it's sort of like working at cross purposes to sort of detract from the authority or the legitimacy of that discourse so um, it sort of um, it, it it makes sense as a as a mode for uh, of interrogation to me, um, uh, the, somebody somebody interested in sort of pressing against established forms of knowledge about diaspora that that aren't being sufficiently kind of queried. So I think that that mode uh, is essential to that. Amanda, thank you. Um, so thank you so much, Roland. That was a Roland. That was an incredible talk. Um, so. Um, yeah, my question is for you. I guess I have one kind of comment question and then a question question. Um, I felt a little bit like Aporia was not quite capturing um, what I felt was really kind of the critical force of your analysis. It felt too forgiving <laughs> as a term. <laughs> So that's, that's my comment question, like complicity, you know, contradiction, uh, dare I say, hypocrisy. That's too strong, I know, I know. 
But anyway, it's just just something I want. That's that's thing one. Thing two is, you know, while you located the I'm going to say contradiction, contradiction in Hartman and Gilroy within the text, it also played upon their institutional locations. So, but we didn't really, I think, I'm a little tired, hear anything about McKnight's kind of like socioeconomic, mm -hmm. culturally economic position. Um, and so I think that made it a little bit skewed. Right. Um, that was another oh, generosity. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. Okay. That's a good point. That's, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, that's a fair point, right? Yeah, those, um, his short fiction, much of his sort of short fiction, uh, Mustafa's Eclipse, uh, and then the two novels, He Sleeps and I Get in the Bus. Oh. Um, so his, his first short story collection, Mustafa's Eclipse, and uh, the two novels, He Sleeps, and I get in the bus are very much grounded in his own personal experiences as a traveler um, uh, in in Senegal, um, teaching and working for nonprofits. And so, so I think some of this is born out of a kind of intimate knowledge on his part uh -huh. of the uh, of the sort of uh, power dynamics that get established between black. Western travelers in their engagement with the Senegalese. And so I think it's all very um, biographically sort of based in that sense. Um, you know, when you're, working, when you're working with contemporary writers like this, you know, there's not as much of a kind of like archival record of that kind of personal history. Sure. But, um, but I think that's, that's um, where a, a lot of that is coming from. Um, as to your, your other point <laughs> about me being sort of like overly, or overly uh, generous and uh, sort of uh, polite to my interlocutors here, uh, you know, that's the first time I've ever had that, uh, <laughs> been, been accused of that, right? <laughs> Usually I'm, I have the opposite problem of the people telling me you're being too sharp-edged or um, ha having... It is the same so. point. It's both points. Uh, you're not owning the sharp edge. Yeah. Well, I, I, I didn't want to sort of uh, stage this in a sort of adversarial way uh, and then get people, you know, particularly in dealing with people as sort of prominent as these people, as these figures and with the kind of like uh, status, the institutional status they have, to immediately prompt people to start being on the defensive yeah, about yeah. their their yeah. idols. Um, so it seemed to me prudent to, <laughs> <laughs> for all kinds of reasons, to 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 do it in a way that um, uh, showed a certain kind of like generosity to to them um, and. Um, and, and have a kind of balance, of, but yet, but nevertheless sort of press the sort of moments of incoherence. Well, what's interesting is that Aperia dis, you know, displaces it to the text yeah. a little bit, whereas yeah. some of these other terms would be more sort of like a subjective mm -hmm. psychological description, yeah. yeah. I, didn't have this, I didn't have this space to sort of fully work out uh, a, a relationship to the sort of, um, you know, the, the, the Derridian and the philosophical tradition of Aporia, which does tend to sort of prioritize uh, Aporia as something sort of discursively situated, yeah. a kind of universal condition of all ethical uh, sort of discourses and yeah. so forth, right? So, um, you know, I, try, I, I did make a, a statement in there that I actually pulled back some of the criticism of Derrida on by you know and, and and sort of trying to underscore that I'm interested in a form of aporia that's emerging out of a set of material social relations right not something yeah. that's simply sort of like discursively constituted and so I, I recognize that uh, I, I recognize that I'm trying to sort of uh, retool aporia right uh, to serve a different kind of ends than it certainly than it 
than it does in de deconstructed discourse, right? Yeah, Michael. Uh, two questions. First, for Layla, I had a question about form of your the structure of your 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 uh, essay. Is it meant to be read horizontally or vertically? Right, because I was trying to trace the way in which <laughs> A, B, C, and the one uh -huh. fit with one another. Right, to kind of get a feel for the actual structural concern you were pursuing with the with with the the uh, almost taxonomy you provided uh, associated with your essay. And then uh, to Ro Roland, whose talk I really enjoyed, I wonder if the overarching consideration here is the aporia of the middle passage, right? Mm. That, and there's a way in which, you know, not to use white supremacy Fs up everything, right? In a way that the, the middle passage itself overflows its boundaries by trying to retrace it basically reinscribes the exact yeah. commodification question that you're raising, right? So when Professor Hartman or Professor Gilroy are retracing that, in that act, it reinscribes the commodification of the existence of the breach in the first place, right? Which is troubling for yeah. a lot of different reasons. So I'm just wondering if that is, is a useful place to kind of overlay some of what you're proposing. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, it, it's it's uh, something I think about more in the sort of like longer piece um, um, and in thinking about like a figure like, uh, Susan Laurie Parks, right, uh, and particularly uh, a play like Imperceptible Mutabilities in the Third Kingdom, right, one of her early works, really um, addresses this very kind of problem, right? Um, she, she's, she pits uh, characters variously sort of grappling with the legacies of the Middle Passage against one another in these different sections of the play um, and many of the characters are um, uh, engaged in different kinds of compensatory gestures and theories about how to manage the legacy of loss and devastation that is the Middle Passage, right? Uh, and so uh, the play is kind of uh, considering the, uh, some of the limitations of their strategies for overcoming the loss and the, and the absence that is the middle passage. But I think, you know, the, the counterpoint to those characters in that play is Parks herself and her kind of like willful insistence on dwelling in the absence itself, right? Uh, and, and indeed, like, the, so much of the play is sort of like structured around, um, again, kind of like making visible the, the, the loss and the absence of the, the unknowability of the Middle Passage as a part of its kind of like aesthetic, um, is, is aesthetic and form, right? So in that sense, she too sort of like, you know, there's a commonality with McKnight in that she too wants to sort of like insist that you sort of like look at the aporia over and against these traditions in which people are trying to like overcome it or provide different kinds of proxies and substitutes for for loss if that makes sense yes. Leela could I could you say a little more about what you mean by verticality because it is an important question and yeah so I kind of got to it late after I realized that you were providing these like landmarks right in in the talk right and i was curious as to whether it would be possible to read the a's sequentially the b sequentially the c sequentially the d sequentially in order to have a particular story that's being told internal to the argument that you're making right because it seemed to me and i couldn't do it rapidly enough as it was unfolding i'm just curious about which what you were uh because it's it, it's obviously intentional, right? You're doing something with the, that structure, and I was just wondering if, if there's a way in which it fits in that way. Um, no, no, thank you. I see. I see about the 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 the, the, the numbering. Uh, um, um, it, 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 entirely so. Entirely so. Uh, in the um, in the interests of uh, producing um, of perf perform performing. Uh, Sonic thought, <laughs> in the interest of performing sonic thought. So if someone 
or, or to get at the 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 the, 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 the making the sonic of the trio semantic structures in the idea of uh, relationship in its linguistic uh, um, in the linguistic gloss that I'm pursuing. So yes, certainly, certainly, certainly that could be done. That could be done, and it is an invitation for that to happen as well. Yeah, I have also a question for Lila. Lila, hi. Um, uh, it's about, if I understood you right, I think you were also playing on two extremes of language uh, from what you called primal hate speech on the one hand, and on the other side, you built an arc to reparative language. And I was also really fascinated by the immense scale at which you thought these, uh, these language, these performative languages, like uh, the 60, 3,000 years of singing, the Mara, and, and so on. But um, I, I wanted to ask if you can, can say a little more about that arc from primal hate speech to reparative language, and especially with an emphasis on uh, reparative language, because uh, I think that's implicit in, the, in a lot of what we are talking about here also. Thank you. Thank you so much for that absolutely wonderful question, which is absolutely at the heart of the project, which is the heart of the project, really, uh, of this particular essay. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I think um, uh, you, you really uh, helped me also to, uh, by identifying the, the components of the piece. Um, but at, at heart, um, it, it, this particular piece is motivated by some anxiety about the, um, the, uh, the, the too easy uh, association of performativity with political agency. Uh, uh, um, and uh, um, an attempt to find uh, um, uh, through these other sources <laughs> and uh, uh, Schwanz, you know, uh, to find or to animate or to set into motion um, some account of uh, how um, um, uh, the, the violence of language is. Uh, violence that inheres in its performativity, in, in precisely in its capacity to make things happen. Um, uh, whereas a kind of a reparative or relational uh, language is precisely one uh, that inhibits performativity. And it inhibits performativity uh, through the production sometimes of, of nonsense, by, by, through the suspension of meaning itself. Um, uh, poetry being poetry of a certain sort, or poetry of any sort, or poetics of any sort, being that suspension of performativity. Um, uh, so um, uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, incredibly helpful and uh, lovely to hear from you as well. Other questions, comments? Okay. Speak in the microphone, please. <laughs> This is for Lila. I, I, I would like you to return to the question that Aaron asked you about I, relationship and separation. Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to ask you to return to the uh, question that Aaron asked you about relationship and separation. Uh, you said it's not uh, an aporia, but you didn't say more about uh, the relationship between relationship and, and separation. And my understanding of, and, and it's really a very uh, preliminary understanding of, of uh, uh, the, this so rich uh, uh, performance, uh, of text, perform, performance of, of, of the text, um, it, is that separation is always a form of relationship. Yes. Okay. <laughs> 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 
Sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. Please, please. Sorry. Please sorry. No, you said. I asked, you said. You answered. You are absolutely right. You are absolutely, absolutely right. And I, I felt um, uh, a kind of anxiety about the brevity <laughs> with which I answered, Aaron. And so uh, thank you for allowing me to be a little bit more digressive in that answer, which is what it, what it really uh, calls forth is that, yes, you are absolutely right. Um, uh, and I, I just want to actually uh, to, to turn the question about to, to, to the language of verticality and horizontal, horizontality to another use here, because it haunts this um, uh, fabrication. This is really what it is, this fabrication in another way. Um, that um, separation is, is, is certainly a, a relationship, but it is a... Uh, it, it is a kind of a relationship subject to uh, certain laws, certain laws and prohibitions, um, uh, and uh, usually a relationship, often a relationship of hierarchy, you know, hierarchy of values uh, above and below. Um, um, not all, not only, but often, uh, whereas. Um, relationship in the particular sense of relationship, poetic relationship, non-performative relationship, is uh, constitutively vertical. You know, it doesn't obey any, 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 any hierarchy and it, uh, any, any boundaries, in, in which sense it is, I suppose, aporetic uh, uh, in the way that Roland is, is suggesting. So yes, I think you are absolutely right that relationship and separation are in this particular linguistic <coughs> kind of fashion two kinds of relationship. Um, one which is uh, uh, governed by, by hierarchy and prohibitions and taboos, and off grammar, for example, and the other uh, which uh, precisely uh, transgresses those rules and inhibitions of grammar uh, by way of a certain horizontal. So, Leela, forgive me for such a dumb question. It's <laughs> much lower than the questions that have been asked and answered recently. Um, but I'm, I'm a little puzzled by the various invocations of words around perform, performance, and format performativity. And I'm especially curious about them because we're going to have a talk about them tomorrow. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know whether the, the person giving that talk wants to say something now, but don't, don't say it yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so if I understood correctly, um, you think that the reparative is good because it inhibits performativity by sounding like nonsense. Um, I mean, that, my notes are probably not <laughs> perfect here. But I'm, I'm, I'm working with a good-bad thing here, just to, <laughs> trying to, you know, reduce things to my level of comprehension. Um, so you also said that what you said what spoke was in the interest of performing sonic thought. So I'm wondering about whether you're kind of for or against performing, and whether you think you were giving a performance <laughs> when you spoke before, so that's one question. And the second one, do you see a difference between what you're doing now when you're answering questions and what you were doing when you gave your talk? Thank you. Um, two very different questions. Um, um, see, I don't know about good and bad, uh, because, I mean, really, I, I, um, I really, I, I take inspiration from others' question. Um, and my, my main interest is in nonviolence. Just, just to, to, to clarify. Uh, Can you say that again, My main interest please? is in nonviolence. In, is in, non is, this is an inquiry into nonviolence. Nonviolence. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, to simply say that violence is bad or that nonviolence is good, I think um, doesn't quite account for the inextricability of the, the two. Uh, um, so I, I do want to say this again to clarify, and thank you for, for pushing me in this uh, direction. It's, it's very helpful. Uh, uh, um, 
is, um, uh, I need to break this down a little further, is um, I, I am my quest or my inquiry is into the puzzlement of a kind of nonviolence that one can find um, in a, a, a certain genealogy of Indic thought um, and its uptake in colonial and post-colonial contexts, where disavowing form, formalization, serves nonviolence. This is the enigmatic thought. It serves nonviolence to disavow form. Um, and obviously, this is a thought uh, uh, that enters into some sort of friction with the Western philosophical tradition. Uh, and really, that's my claim. It's to, it's, to, it's to meditate on the puzzlement, on the form defying nature of a certain proposition for nonviolence. Um, and to think about how, how uh, it might work, what its components are, uh, and how one might follow it through into its limitations on language. Am I doing two different things between the way I, 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 I uh, narrated that paper and what I'm doing now? No, I, I, I'm, I'm not. It's just that with the former, I removed certain inhibitions. <laughs> Um, uh, that uh, uh, prevent the communications of other epistemologies. Um, so I am still communicating epistemology. Uh, it's uh, just that I'm in the previous, in the lecture, in the talk, I was removing certain inhibitions, uh, which I, uh, I may, you know, be moved to remove in the service of epistemology. Uh, but I feel I'm, I'm conveying what I need to perfectly well. Uh, if I feel I can only answer you through the medium of song, I might do that, but I don't feel it necessary at this, at this moment. <laughs> For what it's worth, I'm really glad that you just said that uh, disavowing form serves nonviolence, because I understand that now, and I didn't understand it before. No, no, no. Thank you for helping me to make that. Thank you. I have a question slash comment for Rollin. I'm tempted to sort of go into the sort of specifics of Hartman's like text. Closer to the mic. Thank you. <laughs> the specifics of Hartman's text, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for now. I'm wondering if um, what your, your project and the aporias that you're, that you're addressing is about is less about the kind of shortcomings of individual thinkers, writers, but they're kind of gesturing towards a sort of general condition under which black thought and black writing happens, right? Um, that's the move from outside of the university to the university, not only in terms of academic scholars, but also in terms of writers. I mean, I'm pretty sure that all of those writers at least have a kind of loose relationship with some kind of um, um, institution, right? So yeah, so I'm wondering, if there's not ways to kind of think about this as, you know, um, yeah, indexing a kind of impossibility of doing international work without being imbricated in the neoliberal in a university, um, the, um, um, the kind of non-government um, um, non NGO industrial complex and or, you know, tourism um, um, capitalism, right? I'm, I'm, I don't think that really takes anything away from your point. Mm -hmm. But I think it shifts the emphasis a little bit. Um, and, and I think, you know, that it would sort of get to what I hear you wanting to really address about the way that black internationalism has not only changed, right, but in some ways has become impossible, yeah. right, in, in, at least in a, in, a, in a simple way, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah, I mean, to be... Uh, to be frank, right, like the, the, the presentation that I gave is sort of like the, the most sort of abridged version of this that I could give. Um, and it comes out of a project that in a bigger sense is trying to think about precisely the, this problem of, of, a, of, a, of a moment since the 1980s when 
when uh, African American expression becomes fully institutionalized, when a new professional class of uh, critics and theorists enter the academy to produce a particularized set of discourses to frame that literary expression at the same time that uh, African American literature is receive, undergoing a, a particular kind of like consolidation in the marketplace, right? So this this is the this is the book project that I'm working on more broadly. Mm -hmm. So I think that when you take a step back and see this strain of internationalism in that light, right? It's a it's a subset of a broad set of historical processes that are changing the kind of conditions of production for uh, for black literature and for bl the black intellectual mm -hmm. at this time. And so I think all those things contribute to, I think in the broader framework, you would see the sort of, see the sort of, um, the social character of mm -hmm. it rather than the individual writer, individual intellectuals. Mm -hmm. That's just a sort of device mm -hmm. to get us at it here. I just had an idea for a novel. <laughs> and, um, um, a man, <laughs> man gives a talk at a political concepts conference. It's all about the imbrication of black intellectuals in, um, in, um, slave, in the slave economy, of, in, in the tourist economy in Ghana. Um, but also about sound systems in the UK and their imbrication in, um, in um, uh, in commodity culture in the UK. The um, paper gets turned into a book. Um, it's published with pretty good press. Actually, it does pretty well. In fact, it wins a Pulitzer. Uh, <laughs> and so it's a science fiction novel. <laughs> uh, before you know it, the intellectual in question um, is being um, recruited at some of the best institutions in the world. Um, <laughs> Uh, he um, he it becomes the new name of you know black studies, and um, does pretty well out of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's your novel. <laughs> the end. Yeah, yeah. And I, I I guess the you know, given the nature of the project I'm working on, I would just be like, yeah, of course, a poria. Of course, that's how it all works. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure I know what, <laughs> I'm not quite sure I know exactly what you're, you're asking. I, I understand the, the trajectory of the narrative in that, you know, it's just a sort of a, 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 a vicious circle of commodification and institutionalization that, that said writer uh, also then sort of gets folded into, yeah. right? Um, I, so I understand that nightmare scenario you're describing, <laughs> but, but I'm not quite. I'm not quite I'm, sure. What I mean, Percival story. Everett would have a whale of a time with this novel. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what's at stake in it for you, Aaron. Well, you already said there's no exit. I mean, you already know that that nightmare is. That's why I was curious about satire. But um, since you zoomed out to the book project, can I ask you about the end of identity? Uh, actually, that's like a. I think you have like an older title. Oh, when I never. first started working on this years ago. Um, yeah. The new title is um, Blackness Incorporated. <laughs> yeah, thank you.